all good. There you are. Hi, Tony. Oh, hi. Hello. Hey. Hello. Uh, nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you. Oh, great stuff. Yeah. Where's Woody? <laughs> He's, he's, he sends his apologies. He's in a vestry meeting on a Zoom. Ah, right. Okay. Yeah. He sends his best. Uh, good. Great to see you. Yeah. Hi, Helen. <laughs> There's Toby. Hi, Toby. Oh, hi. You can unmute yourself if you want. Let's see. Let's see. No, I'm not. Oh, I'm there you are. Am I unmuted? No, yeah, yeah, we good. hear you. Okay, you know, I should tell you, Dara and Donna, I went to the website and I was sent back to the old link. Oh, oh I updated it here. Let me see if I... Maybe remove it and do it again. I don't know. It ju I just did it, so... Because I, well, that's weird because I clicked on it from there. That's how I got on it. Huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it, it was an know. updated link. Yeah, mm -hmm. it says updated Zoom. That's weird. Yeah. Unless maybe you had an, an email. Were you, Toby, were you on the event tab when you saw that? Oh, that's too hard, Dara. <laughs> <laughs> oh I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> no, no, no. We saw your pictures for Wednesday Zoom. You know how to use, you know how to use technology. Oh, I do. I do. <laughs> I just know that at first it said that it was still like I was on the wrong day. But hi, no. Tony. It's so nice to meet you. Hello, Toby. Uh, 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 Mary is saying she can't unmute. That's what I'm saying. I'm looking and I let everyone unmute themselves, but on the bottom for left. John, let's see, John. I see Paul. Hello, Paul. I'm live. Oh, There's John. <laughs> There's John. Who else? In living color. Robert wants to unmute. Let's Hi, John. Um, Hi, Heidi. There's Teresa. Wait, let's unmute Teresa. Um, Robert says he can't unmute. Let's see. There's not. There's not unmute at all. It doesn't let you. Do I that. did that. It says it. So let's see, Robert. Okay, there you are. At the um, no, we're gonna get started no, no, no. soon anyway. But if anybody wants to say something, if they type in the chat, we could unmute them if they need to. Heidi, you can hear us. Yep, Heidi's there. Yeah. It just unmuted. It says um, it said the host if you want to be unmuted. <coughs> oh, yeah, okay. yeah. I'm clicking everybody in case they wanna. Okay, let's let everybody in. Okay. Okay. So should we get started? We shall get started. Why yeah, not? but we're going to have to just mute everybody while we're having the presentation because it's pretty long. <laughs> yeah. so, so Donna, you're recording. We're good? Yeah. Okay. So welcome everyone to our Zoom. We really appreciate everyone understanding the need for us to reschedule it and Tony for being so flexible. Um, we're going to get started quickly. We just have some housekeeping notes. Feel free to chime in in the text on the bottom. Um, anything you text, especially if you say it in caps, if it's something that Tony's discussing, Donna and I will constantly look at the chat and try to interject while Tony's explaining things to us. We have a lot of incredible information and photos that Tony is going to share. So we're, we're going to try and um, keep the chat rolling as we go along. We have been hosting these Zoom talks and events during COVID and our monthly tournaments to help all of us stay connected. I know, like Tony said, when we first started, it was exciting just to see everybody's faces and say hello and chat. If you missed any of them, you can visit our YouTube Modern Mahjong channel and you could watch the replays. So thank you for your support of our small business. And that's what keeps these Zoom talks going. And Donna's going to continue. Well, Darren, and I are just very excited to have you, Tony. And I want everyone to understand it's 12 midnight, his time. So <laughs> we appreciate him staying up for this. Um, we're gonna, he's going to talk about Mahjong history, culture, restoration, and the art of Mahjong tiles and boxes. Welcome, Tony. Can you tell us a little something about yourself? Yeah, I'm uh, Tony Watson, also known as Bones, because I'm uh, skinny. <laughs> yeah, um, I've been a, a computer engineer for 34 years, uh, but I've been retired 17 years. Um, I played Mahjong for 45 years. 
and uh, and I've been restoring and collecting uh, mahjong for 10 years, about. Uh, I'm self-taught and I'm still learning. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's about it. Yeah, I've been married to Joe for 50 years this year, and uh, we've known each other for 56 since I was 17. Yeah. And how many children so, and grandchildren do you have? Yeah, we got uh, two children and five grandchildren. That's wonderful. Yeah, um, and their ages range from 25 to six. So, uh, yeah, big range. Yeah. Wow. Well, so thanks I'm for sure sending all the pictures. Dara's going to start sharing yeah. her screen. So I'm sure all of you who know and are familiar with the amazing work Tony does would love a, a little behind the scenes, almost like a Willy Wonka tour of his uh, workshop. So here is Tony's workshop. So as we go through the photos, Tony, please let me know if I'm going too fast or if yeah. I should speed up. Okay. So this is my garage. It's a, it's a single car garage, uh, a single UK car garage. And so very small. <laughs> Our house was built in the 30s. So it's, uh, it's only eight foot wide. Um, now in the, the front left, you can see some reclaimed wood that I've got. And above that is a chop saw. Behind that is a, uh, that's it, bandsaw. Yeah. And behind that, a pillar drill and a scroll saw and a lathe. And um, yeah, the yellow thing in the center right is a, uh, uh, another larger bandsaw. Belt okay, sander. Yeah, a uh, table saw. Um, this red thing at the front is a planar thicknesser. And uh, underneath that, the yellow thing is a compressor and uh, the vacuum cleaner at the, uh, in the, the center there. So not Wait. much room. Yeah, uh, so uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the, the next clip. Yeah, I'm going to go back just because I didn't mean to be drawing on that. I don't know how I did that. <laughs> I was wondering. <laughs> okay, so this is this is my workroom and this is where I, I, I store most of my collection. So these are all uh, mini sets and uh, homemade sets. And uh, on the on the top are all the French sets. And um, yeah, wow. below there you can. Oh yeah, you can. Uh, and these here at the at the left, uh, middle left, are uh, all the um, uh, U.S. sets. Mm -hmm. And below them is my collection of um, of dominoes. I've got about 150 sets of them. Um, Tony, we already had the question we, we figured were coming was how many do you own? Robert was asking. <laughs> um, yeah, about 500. Uh, all in various states of repair as well. I, I, I get very little time to work on my own sets. Yeah. So these sets you're seeing now, they're, they're the German and Austrian sets. And, um, and here we have uh, most of the, the Chinese sets. And um, yeah, on, on top there, you'll see uh, the Alex Chang's, uh, oh, oh, right here, we've, we've got uh, my, my workshop. Yeah, the top, yeah, that's, that's, that's my workplace. Absolutely cluttered, but it, it's, it's how I work, you know? So I've got my, little, my polisher, you can see there, and that's where I buff uh, tiles on. Um, there's all my 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 paints and uh, paint brushes, glues, um, basically everything I need within the immediate reach. Um, yeah. So and this is my my other workspace behind me, which uh, which I use for uh, making mouldings and uh, and stuff. So there's my resins at the front there and um, sets I'm working on. Yeah, we're going to talk about that later. We're going to ask you yeah. about that later. Yeah. So, and this is, uh, this is boxes I, I collect and uh, I collect typewriters as well as a couple there. 
and uh, and I collect old uh, tools. So you can see the old brace and bits and Archimedes drills and <laughs> stuff like that. And, uh, Amazing. Yeah. So this is is the first set uh, my wife bought um, when I was for my thirtieth birthday, <laughs> and it's the set we use for uh, all our games. We've um, yeah, when we were first taught, it was by a, a couple in uh, Scotland, and uh, and they had a, a, a small uh, bone and bamboo Chinese set, and could we find one? It was it was impossible, so Joe bought uh, this uh, Japanese urea set, mm -hmm. um, and it was quite expensive at the time, but it's uh, it's a great set, great heft, real good feel. Uh, super um, um, pictures, you know, um, so it's easy for people to, to learn. And like I said, it's a set we use all the time. Now you were telling us that you had to leave a set behind and then recover it. Was this the set? This was the set, yes. This is, um, we were in, um, in the Middle East for 15 years and um, when we first moved there in uh, 1989, uh, we were there for a year and then Saddam invaded um, with this, so we were in Kuwait and uh, so we got kicked out. But I, uh, I moved back to the Middle East um, after the invasion um, to Oman. And um, uh, part of my remit was to uh, reinstall all the uh, computers in um, Kuwait. So I went back and visited my, uh, my old apartment, which was shot to pieces and, uh, and everything was strewn around the floor. So I managed to find all, most of the pieces um, for the Mahjong set, uh, missing two tiles, but there were spares. So um, yeah, afterwards, Wow. Um, when I when I retired, um, um, I, I carved two of the the two missing tiles, and um, and you can't tell which ones they are basically, you know. So I, I thought I've I've got a bit of skill at this. So um, yeah, then I uh, I made a, a box for Joe. Uh, which is the uh, the next set? I think here we go. No, no, this is a, this was um, a set we got um, when I discovered eBay, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we wanted a, a set like the one that we were taught on, and uh, and I saw this in France, and it was in a bad way, but it was cheapish, and. Um, it came and it was in a right state. It was covered in yellow gesso, uh, missing handles, uh, all chipped and uh, the, the joints broken. So I dismantled it completely, stripped it, glued it all back together, fitted new handles and repainted it. And so this convinced me I had uh, some sort of skill, yeah. So then I made uh, a box for, uh, for Joe uh, f out of uh, reclaimed. Oh, these, those were the, oh, uh, the, the tiles. Yeah. That was the, the first tiles. box, right? And, yeah. and just so everyone knows, sorry to interrupt, in case the chat, in, in case the pictures of everybody is blocking the screen that we're sharing, you can click on the, the pictures of everybody and move them away. You could scroll, you know, pull it around in case it's blocking what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so this was the first box that you made from scratch? Yeah, this was the first one I made uh, from uh, from an old mahogany table. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's, um, yeah, basically okay. just uh, a, a, a box of, uh, I, I, I got handles from uh, B&Q. The, uh, the sparrows are inlaid with uh, laburnum dust. And uh, and glue, so I I, I carved the uh, the impression and filled it with uh, laburnum dust. Mm. Um, and here you can see the and the back, yeah, the uh, the sinograms there are, are uh, rosewood dust, mm -hmm. and uh, and I've got uh, laburnum string in ar around the uh, the the outside of it. So the next one is the Keelan set, there and, and yeah. 
Well, like, can you tell us about it and the black boxes you restored? Right. So this is the key uh, one. Well, I, I stupidly, <laughs> I, I'd convinced myself that I had a, a bit of skill uh, at uh, restoring <laughs> boxes. And I, I bought a box from uh, Bill Price. And uh, stupidly, I, I mentioned that I uh, could, you know, fix things. <laughs> and the floodgates opened. So he sent me a, a whole load of sets, and this is one of the first ones, and, and it was in a very bad way and, uh, and a bit of a challenge. You can see how much uh, is missing uh, from mm. the, uh, the, the set. You know, there's uh, bits missing, uh, all the border is missing on, on this shot mm -hmm. and, uh, and bits of the background and everything. And this is a, this is a key Lin. It's a, it's a mythical Chinese beast. Hmm. Um, my wife couldn't recognize what this was uh, at all. Um, so this, uh, this photo shows the, uh, the stages in the, in the repair. On, on the left, the, uh, the box as it came to me. Yeah, and missing all these bits. Mm -hmm. And uh, I recreated uh, the, uh, the bits the missing bits out of um, resin and uh, I made molds uh, out of uh, plastic. Um, how did I make the molds? It wasn't out of uh, silicon rubber. It was out of alginate, yeah. which they use uh, in the, uh, the dentists, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah. Tony, um, I'm sorry, just to interrupt you to go back one, when you said the dust, is that like burnum dust? Is that like sawdust some uh, Sigrid was asking? Yeah, from uh, sanding. Yeah, I, I um, a neighbor had, uh, had a laburnum tree fall down, and uh, so I salvaged a whole load of, uh, of the wood from that. And um, this this wood is is white or yellow um, sapwood, and very dark, almost like ebony um, uh, heartwood. Do you add different colorings to it? Um, no, that was that's the uh, that's the color it is, you know. But you can, of course, yeah, you can add uh, add color. And, and just because we missed it while we were first starting, do you remember? I think you had said, was it a seven crack that you carved from your first set that you recovered? Yeah, which time um, somebody wants to. I think I think it was a five crack and a seven crack. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> so um, I, I I can't I can't remember. Yeah. Uh, Sarah, the next one we want to talk about was the black boxes. Yeah, here I'm just going to show these. Yeah, really. so, yeah. Oh, more. Wow. So yes, yeah, so th these. So this shows the stages in the, in the the restoration, mm -hmm. uh, the box as it came, and then cleaned and uh, the uh, mm -hmm. uh, appliques added, and then the box painted. Mm -hmm. Wow, what a difference. Amazing. And, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, before we get uh, onto the, uh, the, the black box, um, mm -hmm. perhaps I should uh, talk about um, Cinnabar, which is what the, the previous box was. Um, Cinnabar is a, it's a generic term for um, mercury sulfide. And uh, we've all seen these uh, these red boxes uh, that are carved and and that, and it's all made out of um, uh, urushi lacquer and a filler with this uh, this red pigment. Mm -hmm. And there's loads of other pigments that uh, that are used, and uh, they've all got great names. I'll, I'll I'll go through a few of them. There's uh, minium which is a brick red color, orpiment, which is bright yellow, verdigris, uh, green, yeah, malachite, another green, mm -hmm. uh, azurite, ochre, sienna, ceruse, galena. All these are, are uh, heavy metals and, uh, and obviously quite dangerous to work with and, and they're, they're not allowed anymore. But all the boxes that we get from China are all made with these old um, pigments. Hmm. So when you're working on them, you, you have to wear a mask, you know, hmm. or 
do it wet. You don't want this this dust flying around so you can inhale it. Right. So um, yeah. So yeah. Okay. Cinnabar has been used for a That's long so time, cinnabar. right? In ancient <laughs> China, they use cinnabar. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> <laughs> not staying awake <laughs> yeah no, no. <laughs> so yes that, that's the the colors that they uh use in um in these old uh, chinese uh, right. boxes tony when you say old uh, beth asked how old are these boxes do you have an estimate of their age um the a uh, hundred years probably plus mm -hmm. um uh, I, I think a lot of these boxes were repurposed um, to house mahjong sets during the boom time. Um, yeah, I, I don't think the Chinese had uh, such elaborate boxes, you know, not, not the regular Chinese people anyway, you know, maybe the, uh, the upper echelon did, but uh, yeah. Uh, that's Craig saying, yeah, some jewellery boxes we use for tiles, yeah, and, and, and she's right, yeah. So you never worry about working with the mercury and the, I mean, they're very toxic. And Yeah, it, it, it is, but, you know, it's only if you inhale it, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it can't be really absorbed through the skin, so uh, it's, it's not a problem, yeah. Cool. So, um, yeah, this uh, this box we're looking at just now. Uh, this is a um, a box that was sent to me by uh, a cat. Better <laughs> <laughs> than crickets, right? <laughs> this is a, a very nice box sent to me by by Bill. You know, uh, to, and it needed uh, fixing. It was um, the front door was uh, was broken, as is usual with these uh, uh, these sets. And um, yeah, I, it had been spray painted black. Mm. Now, uh, what possessed the person to do that? I, I have no idea. So I, I tried to uh, the strip uh, the uh, all the the black off, mm -hmm. and um, and I, I couldn't. It was uh, it you know I was going to ruin the box if I if I took it. Uh, right back because of the, all the uh, the uh, carvings had these these black specks in the grain you know so mm -hmm. uh, after consultation with him we decided that we we're going to repaint it and there's plenty of precedent for uh, repainting i mean there's a couple of boxes on ebay at the moment which are um uh, very similar um colors to to this so uh, i i did this one in uh, in reasonably muted colors. Um, how yeah. long does something like this? We got a question from Marilyn. How long does something like this usually take? It, it takes a long time because the their um, the carvings are uh, very you know, raised off of the surface. You have to paint around the around the corners and everything, you know, and. Um, yeah, so it, it takes uh, quite a bit of uh, time. Do you usually switch back and forth between working on boxes and tiles, or do you stick on one project? I, I, I multiplex, <laughs> because uh, a lot of the time uh, I'm, I'm gluing things up and, uh, and these take, uh, you know, forever. You know, uh, typically when I'm, when I'm gluing a box, um, it needs, um, I use hide glue. So this takes a day to set. You know, I use hide glue because it's reversible. Mm. So in the future, if somebody wants to, you know, if something breaks and they want to um, undo the set, uh, they just uh, apply heat and, uh, and the, the glue softens and then they can dismantle it again. Whereas with modern glues, uh, that, that would be impossible. You would break the box. Right. So can you tell us about carving replacement tiles and painting them? Yeah, sure. Let me uh, let me go to my screen. Yeah, we, you sent us some pictures when you received tiles, what they look like. Yeah, yeah. So this is 
this is um, a, a set of tiles uh, I, I received, um, and as as they were received. Now, what I do is I, I photograph um, all the boxes and all the tiles that that I, I get as a record, you know, before, during, and after. So this is the before, and I think somebody has tried to clean them and with disastrous results because <laughs> these um, the, the paint is water soluble. So, and, and the, what we're looking at now is me just having cleaned them. Mm -hmm. So I just uh, put them in water face down for about 10, 15 minutes. Wow. And then a toothbrush, quick brush, and, uh, and we see the result. So that's a great warning for people that try to clean their tiles and water. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> it's a complete no-no for the vintage tiles yeah. to put them in, in, uh, in any sort of liquid. Right. So to paint the tiles, um, I just flood the tile with, uh, with paint. Obviously trying to keep away from the Haversian lines and you know, the, uh, the blood vessels within the bone. But um, and I'm not precious about, you know, trying to keep uh, fastidiously within the, uh, the tiles. And it's the way that the uh, Chinese did it um, in the past. It was just flood the tiles. You've probably seen videos of uh, Sister Bay in, um, in Hong Kong right. um, who uh, paints the tiles just like this. Right. Yeah. I see the ones in the left. I say, oh, I could do this. And then I see the, the other ones and I say, I can't do <laughs> I can never do this. <laughs> so yeah, I'd, so the, the tiles are left like that uh, for um, a, day a day for the paint to harden. And now in this pic, you can see what happens with the, uh, with the paint, uh, the, this old paint with, uh, with water it just expands and pops out of the uh, of the uh, engraving, and you can see it's very easily easy to uh, to pick the uh, the paint out. Some of it is more gluey than uh, than others, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's because of different amounts of gum arabic. And here you see me uh, uh, scraping uh, the the tile. So I use a Swiss Army knife, and um, I use a Swiss Army knife because the, the the blade is really smooth and really sharp and um, and very strong as well. And just hold the tile, press quite hard, and pull towards my thumb, and the paint just scrapes off. I and used the, a dental tool, and all the paint came out <laughs> that I had painted. Yeah. Yeah, so no, you just you just scrape scrape it off, and uh, you'll see in the in the next pick, um, the uh, the the result, and wow. uh, and there you go. Um, so you can see the uh, the detail is is left in the uh, the tiles perfectly. Amazing. Yeah. So after that, uh, a quick uh, buffing on the, uh, the, the buffing wheel and, um, and we're done. That's it, beautiful, yeah. yeah. So <coughs> the next one, Dare we wanted to talk about was the, the Hanafuda set that you made. Yeah. Right, Dare? Well, yeah, some time ago uh, uh, on Facebook, a, a colleague showed some orphan uh, Hanafuda tiles that, uh, that she'd bought. And uh, I looked at them and I thought, God, I can do better than that. <laughs> and uh, so I set myself a challenge. And, uh, Tony, and it, can, you, can you just give a background to people who aren't familiar with what Hanafuda is? Yeah. Here, Hanafuda are little playing cards that come in a set like this. And they're, um, they're quite small cards compared to regular uh, playing cards. They're about two and a half inches by one and a bit inches. And they have um, printed designs on. And there's four cards for each month. So 12 months of the year, 48 cards. And it's a, uh, a matching game. 
Uh, well, there are several games, but the basic one is a matching game. And it, it's quite addictive. And uh, we, we played it for years and we taught our kids to play it as well. So you can see uh, in, in front of you the, uh, the, the, they use the flowers that are in bloom at that particular month of the year. Yeah. So there's pine for uh, uh, January and then um, plum blossom and we've got iris further down and pampas for August. Um, yeah, and Paulonia for uh, December. And um, yeah, so this shows the, the size of the tiles and the sort of detail that, uh, and... So did, yeah. did you have an entire set of blank tiles or you made the tiles first? Uh, I know I had, I had a set of, um, of uh, ladies tiles, um, which had quite thick bone. So I was able to slice off the, uh, the the top surface. So I did that on the bandsaw and uh, and then sanded the, uh, the the tiles on the linisher. Um, so that gave me blank tiles uh, to be able to carve. So I I had I printed off uh, copies of uh, of all these tiles, sized them to to fit, and pasted them face down on the. The, the blank tiles mm -hmm. and then rubbed off the uh, the paper which left uh, an imprint of the uh, the, the, the design mm -hmm. which was uh, which I used to uh, to carve the the um, the image I like how you put your this, name this in is the, 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 the drill that I use it's a it's a, a dental drill I um, don't know if you can see the, the size of the uh, of the burr there. That's, that's that's quite a large burr for. I mean, it doesn't look it, but it, it, it it's large for what I what I do. Yeah. Um, um, Tony, sorry to interrupt. We had several questions from Robert and Heidi and Sharon. They all want to know what type of paint you recommend and use. <laughs> but what what kind of paint? paint. Oh, paint. Oh, yeah. I. Uh, I use Humbrol, which is an in, enamel paint. I've, I've tried various uh, different kinds of, of paint, um, uh, acrylic and oils. Um, acrylic is too soft and rubbery and uh, doesn't slice off uh, easily like, uh, like enamel does. Now, uh, I know Humbrol is hard to get in the, in the, the States. Um, uh, testers, testers or is what I use. Rev yeah. Revel or Tamiya or Mr. Color. <laughs> uh, there are loads of, uh, of different kinds of, uh, of paint. As and, long um, as they're enamel, is that what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. So the, the, here we can see uh, the, uh, the paint. These are all the different shades of red. Uh, that I use and uh, and uh, green uh, and blue. This is just a, a, a sample of, of them. Uh, I've got a lot more different uh, colors. And I, I, I mix up the shades as well to uh, uh, to match. You know, if I'm carving tiles to replace some in an existing set, I always ask for a tile to be sent. So I can uh, color match. Uh, Just to catch up with the chat, you were complimented by Phyllis on your beautiful craftsmanship. Oh and then Heidi was curious, um, do you keep boxes you make or you sell them? Um, I, <laughs> I am known for not selling anything. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, most of the boxes I work on are uh, commissions from uh, from Bill or from uh, other people in in the states, and uh, my own boxes are uh, are in a, a right state, but I, I've committed myself to uh, to actually working on them and uh, and fixing my boxes now. So I I, I have made a start. And, so and I. Oh. Wait, I was just gonna say, you were saying that this was a, a labor of love. This was a lot more work than carving regular tiles. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah they're, they're much more detailed than uh, than a normal, you know, it, even more than uh, than a flower tile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but it was it was good. Yeah. So, um, I I made a box as well to to house the uh, the set. I, I think it, you can see the. Uh, oh yeah, the, you said the box was made from bamboo flooring, right? Yeah. So I. I, I there it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, yeah, made the box from bamboo flooring and making sure that the uh, the the grain continued right around the edge, um, mm -hmm. as you can right. see there. Mm -hmm. And um, do you buy the hardware new, or do you get it from you know furniture or um, a, a, a mixture? Yeah, I I buy new and um, and I I get old uh, furniture and. Uh, you know, cannibalize the uh, the hardware from mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And and Heidi was curious. Does your wife Jill also have the same passion for restoring and making new sets? Uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely not. I, I I keep getting asked when am I going to get rid of all this junk. <laughs> so um, hey, fifty yeah. years married, so you're doing something right. So uh, well, I, I I guess I must be. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> And, and the thing that I'm doing right is saying, yes, love. <laughs> so you, you have just such an immense knowledge and you said you really you know, didn't have a training for this. So where does your knowledge of the tiles and the styles come from? Where do you learn about all this? I, ju I just read up on it. Um, uh, my mate, uh, Michael Stanwyck has got a, a, a website and uh, he's been heavily involved with uh, playing cards, which is also, a, 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 I, I collect those as well, and, uh, and Mahjong, and he's, uh, he's been heavily interested in the, the uh, connection between playing cards and Mahjong, and uh, he's got a website, and uh, in there is all the, the history uh, behind that. So I've, I've read all that and uh, done other research on, uh, online. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Well, there you want to talk about the Mayfly sets next? Well, I think he was, he was, I, I don't know, Tony, you were talking about the different suits that came from the money-based card games that were similar to uh, Mahjong. Oh, ah, right. Yeah, yeah. Oh. So, so going on, on to the, the history of, uh, of tiles, most of the information that we've got for uh, for old sets and the, the connection with um, playing cards comes from uh, old time collectors uh, like Wilkinson, Laufer, Himley, um, and uh, Coolin, who, who's written uh, a couple of books, and uh, I, I have those upstairs as well. So these sets were donated to museums, so they're there for us to uh, to look at. And are those museums still open? Those are. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's the, um, uh, the well, the British Museum, and there's uh, God, I forget the the name of the museum in the in the states. There's a couple of uh, in in the states. I know Tom uh, Looper but, mentioned one in his um, talk with us. Yeah. You are the game room. So anyway, this uh, natural history and yeah. Brooklyn Museum, that's, that's the one. Yeah, thanks, Greg. Greg, Greg came in. <laughs> yeah. So um, the uh, Mahjong sets uh, had originated in uh, money-based card games like uh, Ma Diao or uh, Shi Hu Pai. Um, and these were the, the long, thin playing cards like this. And uh, they had uh, suits like coins and uh, strings of coins or cash, um, multiples of uh, strings uh, called myriads, and then hundreds of myriads. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the hundreds of myriads uh, suit seemed to disappear uh, somehow. And we were left with these three suits. There was also, at the same time, there was a very similar game uh, to Mahjong, um, like Rummy, uh, called Kun Can, which originated in um, Mexico. 
And this spread like wildfire, um, I'm led to believe, um, and was very, very popular. So this might have been one of the, you know, instigators of the uh, origins of, uh, of Mahjong. So earlier sets had no flowers. Some had seasons, um, but often there, there were just 136 tiles, 140 or 144. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, no jokers uh, at all until 1950s. Uh, the earliest sets um, had a bag of cash or a mayfly as the uh, as the number one bamboo. So now, here's a picture of a mayfly set, right, Tara? So yep. There you can see mm -hmm. the the mayfly, and this is this was the first mayfly set I I ever got, and God, I was stung on this. Mm -hmm. The set was absolutely <laughs> filthy. I mean, th this is how it came, completely black. You know, all the suits looked black. So um, yeah, we, we'll talk about the uh, the carving of this uh, later on. But you can, can you see. Ever, can you ever tell if the black is dirt or tobacco smoke or you know? It, it was just dirt. Yeah. Just dirt. Yeah. yeah. Um, there was no distinctive smell or anything like that, you know, but there were there were remnants of colors uh, underneath. So I could I knew what what colors, for example, the uh, the circles were. Mm -hmm. So I knew there was a red dot in the middle and, a, and then a green circle and, you know, that. So I, I, I documented all that in, the, in um, a word document and kept that with the, uh, the set as a reference. But the um, yeah the mayfly mm. here you can see that it it looks just like a mayfly. In fact, there's a bag of cash and those those uh, stringy things there are the strings that close the bag. Mm. Now, if you turn it down upside down, you can see how that could be interpreted as a swooping sparrow, cock or a sparrow or and. I think this is this is how um, the uh, normal bum bird that we see evolved. So on we go to the uh, the uh, mayfly set. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the the um, the previous uh, photo was um, I, I carved the uh, the the set. Um, because it was so badly worn, you know. I mean, you you could hardly see some of the uh, the designs. Mm -hmm. So I recarved them, you know, keeping the the same style as the the original carver, and then did the same flooding with paint, you know, and slicing off the paint, mm -hmm. as you see in the uh, the next one, and then. Um, sanded the surface to uh, to get rid of uh, all the marks, and um, and that's it as as we see it. And so this is um, a, a very early set. And uh, yeah, Greg Swain wants to know how old do you think it is? <laughs> I, I think this is probably nineteen hundred ish, mm -hmm. maybe maybe earlier. I'm not sure. Um, I asked Michael Stanwyck about it, and uh, and he said it could be anywhere. He is no notorious for erring on the side of caution, and uh, and he said it could be anywhere till the mid twenties. But uh, from my experience, this this is uh, very early. So. Common wisdom has it that uh, Joseph Babcock introduced the uh, the game to the West in the 1920s, but LL Har, I don't know the guy's first name, I'm sorry, um, and he's uh, he's the guy who introduced Pung Chow 
uh, to uh, America at around the same time, and he has a claim to that, uh, that as well. But there's increasing evidence that the Germans were the first to uh, introduce it to the West. Yeah. You'll have seen on the, the recent uh, Facebook uh, thing about the, uh, you know, misrepresentation of sets. Um, I just posted a, a German vernacular set. Now this was introduced um, for, by uh, prisoners of war, prisoners of war from, uh, uh, from China during World War I. Um, yeah, they, they had an enclave in the uh, Shindang uh, Peninsula and uh, when war was declared, um, China kicked them out. Um, it, was, it was their military base in, in China and they were kicked out. So, um, yeah, the, uh, the, the military people were uh, detained as prisoners of war. Uh, diplomats went to uh, other countries, uh, sorry, other parts of China. Um, but the upshot was that the China was, uh, Germany was forbidden to deal in any way with China. So they, they could not import any sets. So the only sets that they got in China in, in Germany were the ones that people had bought while they were there. And so there's very limited uh, a palette of uh, designs that they had to choose from. And if anybody familiar with the German sets will, will know that uh, they are a very limited uh, design palette. Unlike the Austrians and the French, who got uh, renowned for uh, very different uh, sets. So, um, yeah, but during World War II, um, games were almost forbidden, more or less. All work was transferred to uh, the military. So, uh, yeah, production almost stopped. Not so much in America, but uh, for certainly in, uh, in Europe. Um, but in America in 1937, uh, Viola Cecil and friends uh, decided to improve Mahjong by introducing set hands on uh, the, the now familiar card that you're all used to and changing the card every year. Um, so, and to make the game uh, more exciting, introduced more and more flowers until you got to like a, a ridiculous amount of 24 flowers. Mm -hmm. And then they introduced jokers um, gradually until we get the uh, eight flowers and eight jokers that we have today. Mm -hmm. So um, thankfully that, that's, ridiculous amount of uh, jokers stopped, mm -hmm. um, of uh, flowers stopped. Yeah. And then so, you were saying in China, they began destroying. Yeah. But in China, uh, after World War II, the Communist Party uh, took over and uh, Ma Jong was seen as a uh, non-productive and uh, yeah, a waste of time. And um, there was a systematic clearance of all Mahjong sets and Mahjong factories and all the documentation. So there is nothing from, uh, from that period until, the, uh, until uh, the 1979, uh, when the restrictions were um, relaxed. But in Hong Kong, which was a British um, colony at that time, um, those restrictions didn't apply. So with the, they were still continue producing sets and, not, and that's where most of the sets come from hmm. that, we, that we see, uh, most of the modern sets, yeah.
So, and uh, the upshot of that was that there were a large history of uh, mahjong playing was lost to the Chinese. And um, all the sets that they're producing now are very bland and um, simple. And, and that's the way they like it. So there, there's a, there's a, a, a culture in, uh, in China of not liking old stuff. Mm. You know, broken sets and things are, uh, uh, are not valued. Um, unlike in Japan, where the old is revered and uh, broken things are restored and, and sometimes uh, cherished more than than the, the actual real thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So there we go. So thank, so thank you for that history. For, um, for boxes, you were telling Don and I that there's an issue with restoring boxes just because of the way, the problems that you have with those. Yeah. Most of the boxes that I get that come to me are like this. You can you can see the uh, the um, missing the front. It's missing the back. The runners here are all broken. Here um, and the, the the runners here. And the the problem is shrinkage um, these boxes were uh, intended for uh, central heating and um, when they come into central heated houses um, they uh, they shrink but only one way they shrink across the grain like this mm. not this way but this way but the drawers here, they, they don't shrink. So this produces pressure on the, uh, the, the front and back of the box, so much so that the, they either can't be opened or they burst the, uh, the, the back or the front off and it gets lost. So that's why you see loads of sets with no fronts. Mm -hmm. So my job is to fix that. So um, what I do is I, uh, I shave off some of the, uh, the length of the, um, of the trays. So I slice about six millimeters off, off there and glue the, uh, the box back together again. And, um, and then recreate the front and a back and um, fix on wood to the sides and um, yeah, make new uh, rebates for the, uh, the sliding door to go into. Um, yeah, I, I strip the box here. This is it. I take off all that, all the hardware mm. and you can see underneath the, the how the, uh, the 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 wood has 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 changed. Um, yeah, here you can you can see the damage mm -hmm. there. That, that that should project out to out to here. Mm -hmm. So I I I dismantled the box, just burst it apart, well gently. <laughs> obviously, uh, and I find that much easier to work on, you know, if I have uh, four flat panels. And uh, to clean them, I, I scrape them rather than uh, the sanding. I use a uh, hmm. one of these, which, which is your, your ordinary utility knife, hmm. but I, I file off the, uh, the, the little corners there so they, it doesn't dig in. And then I just scrape like this, and you can uh, you can probably see the dust that's coming off, mm -hmm. and uh, and the old shellac. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, as I'm scraping, you can hear that that click, 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 and that is the remnants of a uh, of a pivot, yeah. a handle pivot. 
Most of these pivots are uh, twin tailed. Now you can, you can see there. And they, they just stick them through, the, through a hole in the box and then fold over these tails. Mm -hmm. So getting them out is a, um, is a bit of a problem because they very often break off. Mm. You know, this is one of the few that, uh, that actually didn't break. But some of them are, um, they're, they're, they're like plugs. Mm -hmm. can, you can see that square plug. Mm -hmm. And that is what was on this box here. So that plug broke off. Mm -hmm. So that has to be uh, drilled out or pulled out, mm -hmm. whatever. Now putting a, an old pivot back in would be problematic because it would probably break off. So what I do is I make new pivots out of brass. Of course you do. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and put a put a, a, a screw hole in the in the bottom and um, screw them onto the uh, onto the box with the uh, countersunk screws. Um so much easier to uh, repair and replace, you know. Um, right, where I'm at. I'm um, okay. gonna ask you, what glue do you use to put the wood back together? If, well, like I said, on the, um, on the, uh, the joints of okay. the box itself, I use hide glue. Oh, okay. which is uh, uh, reversible so it can be um, you know heated up and and done it again right. but for the uh, gluing new bits of wood on on here I, I don't want that to come apart so I use modern um, uh, yellow glue yeah. um, they call it it's uh, it's a um, yeah, very strong glue. Uh, it's an aliphatic resin, and uh, it's made by Tight Bond. And there are others uh, as well, but um, Tight Bond is the one I use. Um, okay. Um, you were talking about matching the color of the wood. Oh well, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the 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 color matching. These old boxes were made out of rosewood. Some of them. Others are uh, made out of uh, padauk or mahogany. And to imitate rosewood, they, uh, they would use uh, a, a stain. And I, I've tried various different stains. I, I use um, these things, scratch touch up pens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but beetroot juice. That's the stuff to use. That uh, produces the uh, that rich red color that uh, that we see on these these boxes. Yeah, so um, I use that and uh, and finish with uh, shellac. Mm -hmm. And I, I make shellac out of uh, shellac flakes. Here the these it it comes in um, little flakes like this. I don't yeah. know. If can... Yeah, it looks look, looks like amber. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, this dissolves in alcohol. Um, so I make up batches of this, and um, yeah. So you can see there's some here, and um, it's very quick drying, and it seals the wood perfectly. Uh, a couple of coats of that with a bit of sanding in between and um, yeah we uh, yeah finish with a coat of wax. So in watching you I, if people have Netflix there's a show called The Repair Shop. Tony I don't know if you've watched it. I've watched every episode. We need to get you on The Repair Shop I just decided. <laughs> That yeah. was, that's a great show if anyone's interested. Yeah. So um, 
yeah, I don't know. Uh, I I also make boxes uh, as well. I, I don't know if we can uh, if we've got time to uh, to show some of them. Sure. That'd be great. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let Dara share her screen again. Let's see. Well, you can share it, right? And yeah. And while we're asking Tony, um, somebody asked um, if you play with any of your kids or grandkids. Oh yeah. Yeah, we've taught our kids and grand grandkids uh, how to play. Um, uh, my my grandson um, Zach taught him at four years old, <laughs> and uh, and he beats me regularly. <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> oh, just just if you want to go quickly, and then we'll get to the boxes you've made. Do you want to just talk about the molds you make? Yeah, uh, I. Um, I received uh, some boxes to fix, and I thought uh, I, I could take molds of these uh, these appliques. So I, I made molds using uh, silicon uh, rubber uh, resin and um, and uh, polyurethane resin for the um, casting the uh, the images. So I've got loads of uh, of these that I made, you know, from, uh, from several boxes. Yeah. And um, yeah, cast the, uh, the images in, uh, in resin. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, apply them to the to boxes. Yeah, you were saying you had fixed a few cinnabar boxes with appliques. Yeah, um, so this is this is the latest uh, uh, box that I made. Um, it was uh, a bit of an experiment. I I no longer have this. Um, uh, very good friend in the states has it now. Um, so yeah, it was uh, done on a, uh, a deity's theme. So these uh, these appliques are just fitted to uh, an old box. It was a, a shared art box that somebody had made in his uh, in his garage, not me. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, yeah, so I painted it black, stuck on these appliques after painting them, and um, it was a bit of an experiment, a bit garish for some, but um, mm -hmm. works for me. Yeah. Uh, so, and this is uh, an, another prior experiment. Again, uh, a box that uh, somebody had made in his shed, and um, I painted it in uh, hammerite uh, paint, in uh, bronze and copper. Mm -hmm. um, fitted the appliques and went with a metallic theme. So uh, the, it was all silver and gold and copper and bronze. Yeah. yeah, again, it's maybe a bit garish for some, but uh, but there's a lot of precedent for, for this in uh, old boxes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, uh, the moon is a um, mother of pearl disc. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well. mm -hmm. Very detailed. Okay. Yeah. Oh, and, and this is how boxes come to me sometimes. <laughs> so, yeah. This and this, yeah, this is one I, I made a, a, a few years ago, and it was my homage to uh, Josiah Wedgwood. Mm -hmm. um, and just the, the, the pieces left in plain colored resin uh, on a blue background. And, um, and I thought it was it worked it's as a, uh, you know, sort of replica of um, Wedgwood. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was a, a Nam Ye box that came to me uh, and um, it, it, one, of, one of mine. And I had no idea what the uh, box should look like. So I, I made a, a box with um, sticky back pl plastic covering and uh, made the, the uh, Dragon logo in um, a transfer mm -hmm. and um, yeah, made the box. And then subsequently, this is what the box should look like. 
you know. So yeah, I'm debating whether to recreate that or just leave the box as is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is another uh, experimental box uh, made out of bamboo flooring again, um, in the style of a, uh, a tiffin box that uh, the Indians use for um, bringing their meals. Um, this, was, this box had no front. So again, it was the result of uh, this lateral shrinkage. Mm -hmm. So I, I made a new, uh, new front, uh, carved it with, um, you know, my rotary tools just copying the original design. You make it sound so easy. <laughs> I just carved a new front for the box. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is a fold-out box I, I saw on uh, on eBay. Oh, must be, must be eight, nine years ago. And, and I thought that looks good. And I was, so I used it to house one of my uh, orphan uh, bamboo sets. Mm -hmm. So... That's fun. Yeah, and and this next one was a um, a camphor box that was very water damaged, and um, really in a, a very bad state. Um, so I, I fixed it up and uh, cut holes in the uh, in the center of the faces to accommodate these uh, Japanese plates. Which I, I I cut the the center out of these plates um, <laughs> to make it flat. Um, that was a job and a half. I, I was I was sweating <laughs> every time I was going through this, but I managed to to cut through them without any breakages. Um, originally it was a, a camphor wood color, but I, I repainted it black, and it looks far better in the black. And um, that next one you saw was another tiffin, mm -hmm. um, this time in um, in uh, mahogany. Is the side piece to keep them all together, like there were food we'd go yeah, in that, there? Uh, that... That, that band around the, right. the, yeah, that band there, yes, that, uh, that clips onto lugs at the top, mm -hmm. uh, which are secured by little, uh, little hooks. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, this next one, again, was another wrecked box, um, and I, I thought, I'd, uh, I'll cover that in material. So I had some uh, shot silk material, and um, yeah, I can, you can see the, uh, the, the box here, behind oh, me. Yeah, behind you. Uh -huh. Yeah, so there, there's uh, most of the, these, these boxes, yeah. Um, yeah, so I covered that in uh, in this faux silk and um, with borders of uh, of um, yeah this Greek pattern um, border. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, and th this was a, a, another little experiment. Mm -hmm. This box measures an inch cube, and it's got a full set of tiles in it. The tiles aren't separate, they're, they're just little slabs. Mm -hmm. But the door lifts up and these all come out. And there's a little set of counters and dice in the bottom. That's um, I no longer have this. I, I donated it to, uh, to a friend in the States. And uh, this is a, a four square box. Uh, again, another experiment. I, 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 I like the idea of the twin doors. And uh, this houses a, a Chinese Bakelite set. Mm -hmm. And these poles are um, Nefertiti style. Beautiful. Just, so beautiful. there you go. Any questions? So we were, let's see if we were asked. Heidi, thank you for a very interesting segment. Nancy asked if you could describe again the sets of carving a blank tile. The, if you have a blank tile and you have an image that you have to get onto the, the tile. Oh, right, yeah. Um, I, I photograph the uh, the donor tile or the, or 
the image that I, I, I want. I flip it, then glue it face down on, onto the tile. And uh, then let it dry, wet the back of the, the paper and rub it off with my, my thumb and it just rolls off. And you're left with the glue and the, and the image um, on there. And I use that as the guide for, uh, for carving. And uh, then I, I, I rub off the excess glue and finesse the carving uh, after that. And it, are there any um, people that have come to you to, to somewhat have you be their mentor to learn the different aspects of what you're doing? Yes, I, there's uh, the Paul who's just been on there uh, um, in Ireland. Um, yeah, I've, I've shared what I can with him, you know. So you're, very, you're very generous it, it's, for being here tonight and, and, and other things you've shared. It's very difficult at a distance, you know. I mean, if, if he was sat next to me and could see how I, I'd, I'd do it, that would, uh, that would be much easier, you know. Um, I, I have thought about doing videos, but, um, you know, the setup and... Uh, mm -hmm. and uh, getting Don't close care. and and doing the, the such fine detail you know and moving it, it's it's a logistic nightmare you know so do any um, of your children want to learn uh the restoration uh yeah. no <laughs> <laughs> uh, no not as yet no mm -hmm. so, so diane had asked if you're using that small dental tool for carving yes yeah and then uh, do you also use one with a foot pedal yeah, this is this is the one with a foot pedal. It, uh, here you can see it's um, there you go, and it, it it's got a, a foot pedal attachment, and it's got a variable speed as well. So you and can, I, I know you had said before and something you not to get the ones that are diamond head that you specifically recommend. Oh uh, yeah, the uh, diamond burrs are, are horrendous, horrendous. They they. they they don't leave a, a clean cut. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, these carbide and high speed steel burrs that I use are uh, uh, much more expensive, but uh, but a much better value, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and uh, and much easier to, to work with. You know, the 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 dust and the cuttings they they produce. Uh, much better than uh, than the uh, yeah the diamond burrs seem to melt the stuff um, you what, know, especially plastics. What's interesting is you had watched we we share all of these like this will be uploaded to YouTube as soon as we can yeah. and you were looking at one of our virtual vintage was ones and chimed in. How do you know, just from looking sometimes, like there's just so many materials out there and you had mentioned, I forgot exactly, actually, Teresa, you remember this. There was one tile that um, I think people were guessing what it was and you said it was just, um, was it celluloid or? Um, yeah, could, could be, yeah. I mean, uh, it's difficult to choose between uh, the celluloid and casein sometimes, right. yeah. Um, and that, that could be clear? Yep, it, it can be it can be any color, you know. Um, I, I've got uh, tiles with uh, uh, amber backs uh, that are that are casein, you know. I've also got tiles with amber backs that are uh, celluloid as well. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's um, it's familiarity with the uh, with the material that uh, tells you plus smell. You know, you, you rub a celluloid tile and you can smell the camphor mm. immediately. If you if you rub hard or or sand a, a casein tile, it smells like an old dairy. Yeah. You know, there's, there's that, milk, that yeah. stinky cheesy smell. Right. You know, yeah. um, and uh, yeah, well, Chinese bakelite. It looks like Chinese bakelite. You know, it's like yellow. But uh, you scratch the surface, and it's, it's dark white underneath. Mm -hmm. um, urea formaldehyde—that's the—that's the white stuff. Um, thiourea um, again is white. 
uh, but not quite as stable as uh, uh, urea formaldehyde. Melamine is, is much more shiny than, uh, than urea. And that's what a, a lot of modern tiles are made out of. Plus some of the polyplastics. The tiles that uh, Sister May and um, Uncle, uh, Uncle King in Hong Kong use, they're, uh, they're polyethylene tiles and they warm them up on, a, on a, a little heater before they carve them. So it's much easier to carve. Yeah. So they wouldn't be doing bone and bamboo tiles as, as easily as, uh, as they do the, uh, the, the poly tiles. Uh, we have a question from Shirley Hannock. She wanted to know if you'd give an email address where people could send pictures of their disasters. <laughs> their disaster <laughs> tiles, I guess. I don't know if you want to share your email. You don't have to, but, <laughs> you know. Well, I'd, I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd be opening the floodgates, I think. Right. But I mean, a lot of people know, <laughs> know my address. Right. Uh-huh. Well, this Wait, has been so, wonderful. No, this has been amazing for us to see all these tiles and, and just the fact that these sets would be lost. I mean, I know in the beginning, um, someone had a question if there's, um, are you considering donating some things to a museum? I mean, are there other? Absolutely. Yeah, the, um, I mean, I've, I've got a fairly comprehensive uh, um, selection of, uh, of sets, almost a full set of um, uh, Chad Valley, um, plus uh, some Richter uh, German uh, sets. And, uh, you know, so the, these would be of interest to, uh, to a museum, I, I think, yeah. So the traveling one that we could all see. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering if you ever sign the boxes you make yourself. Do you ever? I, I have I have a little chop. OK. That I, that <laughs> you I should. Yeah. Where is it? Oh. Mm -hmm. Somewhere. Mm -hmm. Somewhere I've, I've got a chop. <laughs> well, well, it's like in, in um, Chinatown in the mural. The artist, her last name is Peach, and she puts a little peach in every one right. that she mm -hmm. does. So, oh yeah. yeah. Oh wait, let me stop. Oh, screen. okay, yeah. And one of the photos we shared. That's it. Okay, that's great. Yeah. That's yeah. So mm -hmm. it says it says bones <laughs> <laughs> with the, with two little birds. <laughs> Well, we thank everybody, especially Tony, for joining us and, and just sharing your knowledge. Just you, you've always been so generous and explaining how you do your work. And we appreciate everybody for joining us on this rescheduled Zoom. Um, Wednesday, we're gonna continue the theme of um, virtual sets and we're gonna have another vintage, virtual vintage. You don't have to stay up till midnight, Tony. You could watch that on the-, <laughs> the yeah, could watch it on YouTube. YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'll, so, I'll I've seen the other ones, yes. Yeah, so Greg Swain said, such a treat for us all. Thanks, Tony. Alice, thanks so much. Greg, Tony, time for bed. <laughs> yeah. So I opened it up. People can unmute themselves if they want to say hello, okay. bye. You know, we know people like to do that. Yeah, time for our Brady Bunch hellos. And, and, uh, if, if you don't know how to, just on the bottom left, there's a microphone. Just click hi, unmute. Tony. So there's nice Greg. To and... Yeah. There's Barney. Okay. Uh, uh, Teresa. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Tony. It was so nice to hear you. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> Tony, we agree. We want a homage on Museum too. You got it. Just said. <laughs> uh, there you go. Thanks, Paul. Hi, Tony. Teresa's uh, on, right? Uh, thank, okay, you. Bye, thank you. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night, thank Tony. You so much. Thank bye, you. Bye, Tony. Dreams. Bye guys. Brilliant. Thank you. Bye, Tony. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. That was really good. Lovely. Lovely to see you. you too. Thank you so Love much, you. Tony. That was really brilliant. Oh, that's great Thanks. stuff. Yeah. Lovely. People say it's time for Tony to go to sleep. <laughs> it's late for him. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.